minister for a moment. Let's look to that right column. We've spent some time having fun over here understanding the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. But what about this ministry of the spirit and the ministry of righteousness? If you'll notice that whenever Paul puts column A together and death goes with condemnation, what goes with the spirit? Righteousness. The ministry of the spirit is also the ministry of righteousness. That tells me this. Remember, back in verse 6, Paul said we're able ministers of the new covenant and of the letter, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. So I'm an able minister of the Spirit. What does the Spirit minister? Righteousness. So if I'm going to be a minister of the Spirit, if what comes out of my mouth is going to be anointed by the Holy Spirit, what must it be? Righteousness. So what must I tell people if I'm going to minister the Holy Spirit? Now, here's where we can get a little confused. We can say, well, if you're going to tell people about righteousness, you better tell them how to act righteous. And that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what righteousness is. You see, righteousness is not doing the right thing. We have got to get this out of our head. I, even in grace churches, I'm still amazed that people are confused on the definition of righteousness. Righteousness is not doing the right thing. It's not doing the good and shunning the evil. How many of you know that lost people do the right thing every day? Amen. I've met a lot of people who don't even believe in God. They're doing the right thing. I'd rather hang out with half of them than some of the believers I know. Amen. But that doesn't make them righteous because they do the right thing. Amen. Righteousness is not the repetitive doing of the right thing. Righteousness is right standing with God. Amen. It's being in the right position with God, which happens to be in one place. It's not a denominational thing. It's not a translation thing. It's not a skin color thing. It's not an English speaking thing. It's not a Western Hemisphere thing. The right standing is in Christ. In Christ alone. The very centerpiece of who we are in, in, in the Father is Christ. Without Christ, we're just Gentiles, barbarians, strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, aliens to the promise. Hopeless without God in this world. We have nothing Separated from God in our own minds, enemies in our own minds. But with Christ, we've been reconciled to God. And in Christ, all of our sins have been paid for. That's righteousness. So if the Holy Spirit is going to minister righteousness, it's not going to sound like, let me tell you what's the right thing to do. Instead, it's going to be the right standing of the believer or the lack thereof of the unbeliever. And how do you get in right standing? How do you get to the place that you are considered righteous? Let me show you that ministry of the Spirit. John chapter 16, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. How many of you would agree that the role of the Holy Spirit is to convict? According to the text, how many of you would agree that the role of the Holy Spirit is to convict? I've not met a Christian yet that disagrees with that. I mean, even sinners believe the Holy Spirit convicts. Convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, verse 9, we'll talk about sin. Verse 10, we'll talk about righteousness. Verse 11, we'll talk about judgment. So let's do it the way that Jesus said it. Verse 8, when he has come, he'll convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. 9, of sin, because they do not believe in me. 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. 11, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, they're very simple. He doesn't say a lot. Not that the role of the Holy Spirit is not complex. But he wanted to make it very simple that we would understand what the Holy Spirit is doing. In verse 9, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. Because they do not believe in me. Notice the pronoun they. I'm going to convict the world of sin because they do not believe in me. What's the sin that the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of? I'm going to convict them of sin of not believing. He doesn't say I'm going to convict them of sins. He doesn't say I'm going to convict them of the sin of adultery. I'm going to convict them of the sin of blasphemy. I'm going to convict them of the sin of lying. None of those things. We interpolate that a lot. Interpolate means you add something that's not there. We interpolate some, that a lot. 
or inject that a lot and say, you know, the Holy Ghost is going to convict the sinners of their sins. And yet you don't have one scripture that says the Holy Spirit's going to convict the sinner of their sins. And you think you do if you think John 16. I've had people take me to this. They were trying to prove me wrong. They'd say, I'd say, you know, the Holy Spirit's not here to convict people of their sins. They go, oh, John 16, 9 says that when he comes, he's going to convict the world of sin. And they don't ever start, quote the rest of the verse. I say, quote the rest of the verse. They're going to convict of sin. Why? Because they don't believe on me. And I want you to notice, A, there's a pronoun they, meaning they, unbelievers. They don't believe on him because the audience of Jesus believed on him. So Jesus doesn't even include them in this statement. They're going to convict the world of sin because they don't believe on me. Look at the next one, of righteousness, because I go to my Father in who? You, ye, you see me no more. He changes the pronoun. See, I'm talking to my disciples. Fellas, when the Holy Ghost comes, he's going to convict the world of sin because they don't believe in me. He didn't say because you don't believe on me. That'd be silly. They believe on him because they don't believe on me. He's going to convict you of righteousness. Because I go to my father and you guys see me no more. So if you believe in Jesus, how many of you believe on Jesus? Amen. He's done convicting you of the sin of unbelief. Amen. Because you believe. Amen. He's moved on. Now he convicts you of something else. What? Righteousness. Did you know convict is the word for convince? He has to convince unbelievers that they need to believe. He doesn't have to convince believers that they need to believe. He has to convince believers that they are righteous. Why? Because I go to my father and you're not going to see me anymore. And what's going to happen when you don't see me anymore? When you can't see me anymore, you're going to doubt you're going to doubt that I live in you and you live in me. I've worked my whole ministry to convince you that the Father and I are one and that if you receive me, me and the Father will receive you. In fact, fellas, a couple of chapters ago, I told you, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my, in my Father's house are many mansions. And then when you sneak down 20 verses or so later, he uses the word mansions again. Now, we missed it because the English translators didn't translate it as mansions. But the only other time he ever uses the Greek word for mansions is in John 14 when he says this. And if any man love my father, my father and I will come and make our mansion in him. We got tricked because the translators of the King James didn't translate it that second time as mansions. They translated it as abode. If any man loves the Father, my Father and I will come and make our abode in him. But it's the same word for mansions. God's not building you a big house in heaven. So when you get home, you've got a seven-bedroom house with a you know, pool table and, and a bowling alley. And both of your dogs from your childhood are chained up in the backyard. And there's a white picket fence. We interpolated the Western idea of a mansion onto a text that doesn't mean that. What Jesus was saying is, don't let your heart be troubled. My dad and I love to move in. So a couple chapters later in John 16, Jesus says, when I disappear, you're going to have to be convinced that you're righteous because you're going to forget it. Because you're trodden through a world of sin and a world of failure. And you're not going to believe you're righteous. And you know what? He's right. We don't. We don't believe we're righteous. We don't even know how to define righteousness. We got righteousness being doing the right thing. We've slipped so far from being righteous. We, we don't, we're trying to work just to do good. We've turned Christianity into do good and don't do bad. It's how we teach our kids in Sunday school. This is the tragedy of the American Sunday school system. As we take our kids into a classroom, we teach them how to do the right thing, not do the wrong thing. We teach them how to be American Jews. We don't teach them that they're righteous right out of the gate. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are never less righteous if you do the wrong thing. You are never more righteous if you do the right thing. You are His righteousness. Live like it. 
Yeah, but I did this this week at school. You are his righteousness. Amen. Live like it. Amen. That's a revolution. Amen. It's a righteousness because I go to my father and you don't see me anymore. You're going to need convinced. And I tell you, we still need convinced. Yeah. And the role of the spirit today, left, right side of the column, the ministry of the spirit is the ministry of righteousness. The Holy Spirit is ministering righteousness into his church, who we are in Christ. And then finally, verse 11 of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And in the third category, Jesus doesn't point to the sinner and he doesn't point to the saint. He points to the ruler of this world. And the Holy Spirit, I, st I believe, is still convincing the world that the ruler of this world has already been judged and of all three of these, this one is the one we probably spend the least time with, and it's the one we probably mess up the most. Because we're all talking about future judgment when Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to come to convince you that the judgment of the prince of this world is in your past, not in your future. So why are you giving credit to the devil? Why are you giving him any authority in your life? The Holy Spirit has to minister righteousness to us. There's nothing else for the Holy Spirit to minister. And it's because the Holy Spirit was privy to an incident that we did not get to see. We see it on Hollywood movies when they make a picture of Jesus dying on the cross. We see it. But it's just a reenactment. We didn't see the real thing. We're taking guesses at what it looked like, what it sounded like, what it felt like. And we watch those movies like The Passion of the Christ, and there's a real pathos in our heart, and we, it breaks and we cry because we see the physical turmoil of Jesus. But we've never, Hollywood's never really captured what Jesus was going to the cross to do with his death. We walk away from those pictures mourning that people would treat our Jesus so badly, but we rarely walk away with a sense of what was happening in the realm of the spirit. And it wasn't just that Jesus was dying for my sins. It was the entire, it was the entire introduction to a new covenant, to a new way of living. Because up until that moment, sacrifice had always been your job. If you killed a lamb, killed a bullock, you killed a turtle dove, you killed a pigeon, it was your job, it was your money. When it came for doing for God, the old covenant was all about doing for God. You did all the work. You built the tabernacles. You maintained the priesthood. You paid the tithe. You bought the lamb. You killed it. It was all you. God gets to the end of the old covenant and says it's not working. So from now on, it's not going to be them. From now on, it's going to be me. On this rock, I'm going to build my own church. Amen. See, they've had tabernacles. I'm going to build a church. They've had lambs. I'm going to be the lamb. They've had the light of the candlestick. I'm going to be the light of the world. They've had the shoe bread that gets replaced. I'm going to be their bread. Amen. See what Jesus did? So it changes everything. So the cross was the first time since Abraham that God gave the sacrifice. See, God put Abraham to sleep in their sacrifice so that Abraham couldn't be involved. And that was the one God loved. That was the covenant that God wanted to be a part of where he blessed Abraham by faith. So when God gives us the cross, he gives us a, a work in which he does the work. That's why we call it the finished work because when we were doing the work, it was never finished. When he does the work, it's finished. Amen. That it need not be done again. But the eyes of the spirit could see things we can't see. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us what the Holy Spirit saw at Calvary. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 15. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. Before I read the rest of the verse, just take a look at that. The Holy Ghost is a witness to us. New King James witnesses to us. When we see the word witness as Christians, we think that means go tell somebody about my faith. If I said to you, have you witnessed to someone this week? What would you think that means? 
Go tell somebody about Jesus, invite them to church, whatever. This is not at all what this verse means because being a witness means you saw something. So if there's a wreck out here outside the church today and the policeman pulls up and you saw what happened, he's going to walk over to you and say, hey, Pastor David, were you a witness to this incident? He does not mean, hey, Pastor David, did you walk up and tell somebody about Jesus? You understand? That's not what he means when he says, were you a witness to this accident? No, I didn't go tell them about Jesus. I saw what happened. So when, when the author of Hebrews says the Holy Ghost is a witness, he's telling you the Holy Ghost saw something. And he wants to tell you what really happened. So if you'll listen to him, the Holy Spirit, who only knows how to minister righteousness, is going to tell you what happened at the cross. Now, interestingly enough, when we get to the next verse... The Holy Spirit doesn't talk about nails, crosses, crowns of thorns, spear sides, gambling for garments, all the stuff that we think make up the crucifixion story. Holy Spirit didn't bother with any of that stuff because none of that stuff matters to you. That's over with. You moved on. What matters to you is what the Holy Spirit saw in the Spirit. Verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their hearts and in their minds while I write them. Time out. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Did you remember Paul said, you are an epistle of Christ. He is writing it not on flesh, but on your hearts. Which is exactly what the Holy Spirit said that God was going to do because of the cross. Verse 17. Then he adds. Oh, what an addition. Their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Let me tell you why you can't have the Holy Spirit if you're going to sneak over and preach the first column. Because the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation, as glorious as it might be, will not be, you will not receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit to preach out of that column. Because according to Hebrews 10, 17, when the Holy Spirit opens his mouth, he cannot remember sins and iniquities. He's not allowed to. Why? Because he watched what happened at the cross. And when he saw what happened at the cross, he knew the Father has changed the rules. Father just did that. That wasn't man doing that. That was daddy doing that. And if father did that, that must mean the game has changed. We've moved out of one covenant and into another covenant. It's no longer a ministry of death and condemnation. Now I have to minister that. That's what I minister. That God has put man in right standing. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul doesn't even differentiate between a believer and a non-believer being reconciled to God. Paul says we thus conclude that if one man died, all men died. And he says that God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself, not counting their sins against them. Did you notice even sinners were involved in the reconciliation? Even the unbeliever has been reconciled to God. He closes 2 Corinthians 5 by saying, be ye reconciled to God. So he says, what do you need to do? Reconcile your own self to the knowledge that God has reconciled you back to him. And yet all we know to do is get up and preach on lying. All we got is movies, music, drinking, cussing. Do you see how much we've cheapened the cross of Jesus Christ for a cheap thrill? For the cheap thrill of a shout and a scream and a jump and an amen. And then we get mad at our teenagers for going after cheap thrills. And we were doing it every Friday and Saturday night in church. Every Sunday morning. Going after a cheap thrill. The cheap thrill of temporary glory when Christ is so much bigger. And the Holy Ghost ministers so much better. Look at what the Holy Ghost ministers. Your sins and your iniquities. I don't even think we've caught this. I don't even, I know I still haven't caught it. I've been preaching this nearly 10 years. It still has never really sunk in how powerful that right there is. I want you to just stare at that for a moment. That's a, that is, a, 
If that wasn't in your Bible, that would be heretical and unbelievable. It's in your Bible, and we're still considered heretics. Their sins and their iniquities. You You can't even believe the next part comes out of your mouth. If you're raised in church the way I was raised in church. You can't even believe. I'll tell you what, when I came into this, I almost got mad. I'm serious, I almost got mad. That was in our Bible the whole time. The whole time. That wasn't an updated version. That was in there. And we never quoted it. Never. I never one time in my life heard that quoted. What were we doing? We were skipping the narrative that didn't fit our mold. We were just running around the stuff that caused us roadblocks on the path to another cheap shout. While the glory was fading away and what we had, we're already scheduling the next event so we can have another shot of our drug of emotion. We're skipping right past the bread that would have sustained us in the middle of the world. And instead, we were falling off by the wayside, right and left, burning out and backsliding on God because we were wore out because we can't do it anymore. Can't do it anymore. Of course we can't do it anymore. We were ministering death and condemnation. What happens when you minister death? It's real simple. People die. People die. They fall by the wayside. Go back to 2 Corinthians 3. Let's do a little reading, all right? Verse 10. This is where we left off at the end of 9. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. I love that. I want you to think about what he just said. Even though the Old Testament had glory, compared to the glory of the New Testament, you really wouldn't even call it glorious. Because compared to the excelling, excellent glory of the New Testament, it was cheap. You know, I loved a lot of it when I was in it. But I look back now and realize it was cheap glory. But it was only cheap because I've seen such better. I've seen something so much better that I go, good grief, what was that? What were we doing? In fact, I've gotten embarrassed by some of the stuff I was involved in, some of the stuff I said, some of the stuff I shouted to, some of the stuff I amen, some of the stuff I tried to get other people to amen, and they amened it. I'm embarrassed. Why? Because I've seen a greater glory. Having seen a greater glory, it looks like my former glory doesn't look very glorious at all. That's the way the new covenant is supposed to be. And listen, if you're in a new covenant church, a New Testament sermon, and you don't see that kind of glory, it's probably not being preached right. Amen. All right. Somebody's probably sprinkled in some ministry of death and some ministry of condemnation. They've drug over column A into column B, and the Holy Ghost is having, he's struggling because he can't minister ministry of death, ministry of condemnation. Listen, there's nothing to stop the spread of the kingdom except us trying to stunt its growth. The Holy Spirit's going to do his work. If we keep sprinkling in the other column, we run into trouble. If what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. What is passing away is an interesting phrase. Please remember, this was not written to you. I told you this last night for this reason. Because you're going to run into a lot of stuff in the Bible that if you don't know who it was written to, when it was written, and what time they were living in, you're going to be confused. According to this verse... According to this verse, all by itself, the Old Covenant is still here. It's just passing away. And the New Covenant is more glorious. And that's why a lot of people that we call mixture keep adding the Old Testament to their New Testament because they're looking at verses like this and saying, it's passing away, that which is done away, Greek phrase passing away, is glorious. You get to Hebrews and it says, it is ready to vanish. It doesn't say it's vanished. It says it's ready to vanish. And so people are going, well, God's not done with it yet because it hasn't vanished away. And the reason we're messing that up is because we're putting ourselves and our timeline into their timeline and their books. 
This was written, all of these were written prior to that temple coming down in Jerusalem in AD 70, which was what Jesus called the days of vengeance. That was the justice and the judgment against Israel's rebellion as a nation against God. And they were judged for it and they were slaughtered in mass by Rome. 1.2 million Jews died on crosses outside of Jerusalem in less than two years' time in, in the, in the, when Titus attacked Jerusalem in AD 68, by, by AD 70, the temple was gone. Not one stone left unturned. Jesus said, your house has been left unto you desolate. These things, uh, this generation won't pass away to these things be fulfilled. And so you've got New Testament writers all the way through the New Testament saying, it's passing, it's passing, it's passing. Well, when will it finally pass? It did. When that temple came down, there was no priest, there was no sacrifice, there was no genealogy, there was no Judaism left to go back to. So when you read a verse that makes it look like we still got some old covenant if we want it, you're in the wrong century. It wasn't written to you. It's for you to now look back and say, if they had it and it was passing away, let's find out when it was done. And when it was done, when are we ready to move on? That is why I can't get around it. I, got, I know some, some, I lost some grace people when I started preaching eschatology. Through, through a lens of fulfilled eschatology, I lost some grace people. They, they want their, I don't know, just be careful. I don't, they want their rapture. They want the world to go to hell in a handbasket. They need it. it, 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 it I, they identify with that very tightly, very closely. And if you minister anything different than that, I've had grace people just cut me off. They were done. They didn't want any more of that. I've even had them say, you yeah, know, I don't want to deal with that. I just want to preach to people the love of God. And I say, that's awesome that you preach the love of God. But you're going to run into some roadblocks in Scripture if you're honest with yourself. You're not going to know how to answer questions because people are going to bring things to you that fit in the timeline of that audience, not you. And then we're going to have to do spiritual calisthenics to make stuff make sense. And we're going to leave not making sense. If the answer you get is hard to explain and more confusing than the question, odds are they got it wrong. That's just a, that's pretty simple. Since we have such hope, we have great boldness of speech. Verse, uh, verse 12. Since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Now I want you to see 12 and 13 together. I, know, I don't know if you can do that. So what we're going to do is read 12, and then we're going to go right into 13. Look at the colon. New King James puts a dash at the end of speech. Colon's fine. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great... Greek word is boldness. Boldness of speech. Not as Moses. Stop. Go back. Is that easy? Can you do that to 12? Seeing that we have such great hope, we use great plainness of speech. Next verse. Not as Moses. Go back. I'm doing this on purpose. I want you to see something that's stunning. We have great hope. We use great plainness of speech, colon, not as Moses. If I were to say to you, give me a guy in the Old Testament that was bold, Moses qualifies. Paul said, not so much. Paul said, I'll use great boldness, not the way Moses would have. Because Moses put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Or as the New King James, unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. So Moses got scared. He knew before he even got to the bottom of the mountain that it was getting less glorious every step he took. So he took a veil and covered his face so that it would take them longer to realize that there was less glory five minutes later than there is right now. And Moses hid that fact from them when he came down the mountain. But their minds were blinded for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted when you read the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Amen. Only Christ can get rid of the pretense and the fake. Yes, sir. 
And there are many people that to this day, I know that was their day, but to this day, still read the old covenant with a veil over their face. Yes, sir. Thinking there's glory to be found in that Old Testament. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And we say, well, praise God, that means when you come to Jesus. Well, we'll start there, but it's not what Paul says. Look at the next verse. He's going to tell you who the Lord is. Now the Lord is the Holy Spirit. When, the, when you turn towards the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the veil is taken away. He doesn't say when you come to Christ. The reality is all of us came to Christ and put our veil on almost immediately. We went into religious performance so people would think better of us. We jumped onto the yes, yes, no, no, do, do, don't, don't train as fast as we could and we did the best we could. We did the best we could. Did all we needed to do. Put the veil on. When we turn to the ministry of the Spirit, Pastor, how do you know he's talking about the ministry of the Spirit? Because he's in the same chapter. He's already built you two columns. He's got condemnation and death on one side and spirit and righteousness on the other. He didn't change topics. He said, the Lord is the Holy Spirit. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, in my Pentecostal days, what this meant was, when the Holy Ghost shows up, you're going to be free to shout. Anybody else ever use that? We'd say, man, some of you so bound up, looks like you've been baptized in pickle juice. I tell you what, we need a revival of the Holy Ghost because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Right? Woo! If we had some Holy Ghost here, you'd be freed up. You want to know why they're so bound up down there in that Baptist church? It's because they don't have the Holy Ghost. And if they had the Holy Ghost, they'd have some liberty. How many of you now know that that verse doesn't have anything to do with that? I mean, you, you and I just walked through it. I mean, you're so far off the tracks right there, it's embarrassing. That's, that's a silly glory. What's the verse say? When you turn to the Holy Spirit, the veil is removed away. And when you turn to the Holy Spirit, that's when you really begin to live. True liberty is not they played my song, now I can shout. True liberty is the absence of veils. It's taking that pretense off and saying, here's who I really am. Here's who I really am. See, I had this on. I've been saved 10 years. I had this on because I didn't think you'd really like the real me. Because I got some stuff in here Come on now. that you're not going to like. And I can't get rid of it. Come on, man. All right. Amen. I am who I am. Come on, but I've been faking it for you because I didn't want you to judge me. Come on, man. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Come on. You know what you were doing? You had a veil. Amen. Come on. The glory of your Christianity was fading away and you didn't want people to know that. So you start doing a bunch of stuff so people would think you were still as excited as you were the day you got saved. Man, I've been there. So you put a veil on of performance and works. You put a smile on when you really had a frown. You shouted when you wanted to cry. And you thought that was the right thing to do. You preached when you wanted to quit. You went to church when you wanted to stay home. And you thought it was noble. And God thought it was a lie. So if you ever turn to the Holy Spirit, let him make you who you really are. Let him just begin to do the work. I think in some cases, this has got to change in the church. I think we would rejoice. If we could just see the work of the Holy Spirit, we would start to rejoice when we saw the real people in the church. Because right now, if the guy ends up drunk, and we'll go, oh, the devil got him. But we probably ought to shout. Because the real guy finally showed up. See, he's been faking the non-drinking thing for 10 years for you at church. Amen. And then he has an explosion. We think he's just had a slow leak. The reality is he dropped his veil one night and got drunk. Come on, man. The rest of the church just kicked the fire out of him. But what if we celebrated and said, that's the real him. That's the real him. Let's pour the love of Jesus in. Come on. I know what I'm, what I'm saying. is, Man, that's... that's revolutionary that's different that's we didn't make any of it up 
I mean, we're just walking through the word. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. We've covered ourselves with masks for so long. Come on, man. It's sad. Amen, Let me give you an example how we do it. You know, anybody else ever grow up with testimony service in a church? Once in a while, people get up and testify, pass the microphone around, maybe hear what Brother George did this week. After you got through the initial glorifying of the devil that always inevitably started, even if we didn't realize, oh, the devil's been beating me up, praise his holy name, you know. That always used to crack me up as a kid. I'd go, man, the devil just got a lot of glory right there. We're just so used to throwing in like, amen, praise his holy name. We'd throw it in right after the devil. <clears throat> so right after we got done glorifying Satan, <laughs> we, would, we would tell what God had done good. But every now and then, somebody would lower the mask a little bit and go, you know, I've been having a lot of problems with anger lately. I'd appreciate if you guys would pray for me. And that'd be a real cathartic moment in the church. Everybody would go, mm, praise God. Bless him. Bless him, Lord. Really? Anybody else? Am I the only one? We got to bless him, Lord. You know, it was safe. It was safe for him to have an anger problem because it made him kind of manly. Okay? It made him kind of manly. You go, well, he's just a man. Or a guy to get up and go, you know, I've been a woman to get up and go, I've been having trouble losing weight. I just feel like I need prayer. I got a little issue with gluttony, and we'd all go, well, God bless her. That was safe. Come on, man. That's I never one time in my life were sitting in church and a guy got up and went, you know, I've been having homosexual tendencies. Come on, man. Would you guys pray for me? Just lift me up. Come on, preacher, man. Come on, man. Now, let me ask you, why did I never hear that? Well, you didn't have anybody like that in your church. Don't Damn kid man. yourself. <laughs> you know, come you, everything you've ever imagined happens in the world is setting in your church. Amen. Or has at some point. Amen. Probably even taught your Sunday school class, played your piano, and pounded your pulpit. I'm not saying every person, but it's there. Why was there no liberty to stand up and say that? Because... What's it take to have liberty? The ministry of the Spirit. If the ministry of the Spirit is not in that house, everyone's going to have a veil. And they're going to guard that veil tightly. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty to be real. In all your warts and your failures and your problems and your sin, there's liberty to be real. While we're sitting around fighting in the church over whether what we ought to accept and not accept, I don't have any interest in that fight. Amen. Because the fight is being led by people who do not minister righteousness. So I'll not argue for them. And I'll not argue against them. While they're lobbying shots and volleying shots back and forth over what we ought to accept in our country, what ought to be considered moral, what, who ought to be considered our leaders, what we ought to have as our morality, I will not involve myself in the arguments neither face-to-face -face nor on social media because I'm arguing from the wrong side of the column. It's an entirely different lens. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Can I read one more verse? We'll stop. 18. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. As by the Spirit of the Lord. We have unveiled our face and we're looking in a mirror. Does old King James say glass? Yeah. The Greek word is mirror. We're looking in a mirror. That's incredible. When we look at this, the ministry of the Spirit, we're looking in the mirror. It's not our reflection, it's His. We're looking at His reflection. And as we look at him we are transformed the word changed is the greek word metamorpho it's where we get the english word metamorphosis which is what a caterpillar does when he turns into a butterfly how many of you know a caterpillar doesn't need outside dna to turn into a butterfly a caterpillar has dna inside of him that is already butterfly dna when a caterpillar is born he's going to die a butterfly unless he dies too soon that's amazing. Did you know I think that, that God gave us the caterpillar and the butterfly to teach us a spiritual lesson? 
He's born one way and he dies another. And inside of him was the butterfly all the time. Now, if you look at a caterpillar, you never imagine that he's going to die a butterfly. But a metamorphosis happens. Truly a transformation. Did you know this word only appears four times in the Greek New Testament? Two of them are in the Gospels. When the Bible says, and he transfigured in front of them. When Jesus transfigured in front of them. The other one is right here in Romans 12 too. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. How? How are we going to go from caterpillar to butterfly? How are we going to go from tendencies and sins to being who we believe he wants us to be? Be not conformed to this world. The word world there is ion, age. It actually had to do with the economy of Moses. Be not conformed to that system, which is do good, get good, do bad, get bad. Do not be conformed to that system, but be transformed by renewing your mind that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. According to 2 Corinthians 3, the way to make that happen is to stare into the image of Christ and you're transformed into his image from glory to glory. The more you see him, the more you are transformed. Thank you, Lord. Man. You already have righteousness. But you may not yet have the transformation you want. You're not who you wish you could be. People are telling you, no, you're the righteousness of God. He's real inside of you. And you love that, but you're not seeing it come out. And don't we all want to see it come out? I, I've not seen a place yet where they go, I don't care if it comes out or not. If they didn't care, they just wouldn't be here. They'd just go, and yeah, forget it. I'm, I'm, I'm cool where I am. I'm the righteousness of God. This is what I am. And you know what? They're still going to go be with Jesus. And there might be some misery along the way and a lot of heartache and a few consequences. But I want it to come out. I don't just want it. I want it to come out. I want it to show up. I mean, if Jesus is nice, I want to be nice. If Jesus is gentle, I want to be gentle. If he's kind, I want to be kind. I don't want to be the opposite of him. I don't want you to have to dig to figure out who's my Lord. None of that defines me, yet I want all of it. I want what he is. How am I going to get it? Renew my mind. Realize what he says about me. Stop dwelling in the wrong side of the Bible. I don't mean stop reading the Old Testament. Stop dwelling in an Old Covenant mindset. Pull the fake veil off. I challenge some of you to be yourself for the first time in your life. You put on a mask. You've been faking it for a long time. Be who you are. Only then will you really, really be able to walk in liberty. And only then will you really be dealt with by the Spirit about righteousness. Who you are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for what has been a tremendous journey today in the word. And I appreciate and and thank you for giving us a chance to slowly, step by step, walk your people through an important passage. And I hope that, Lord, you've given them a special strength through this as it's been long, but I believe it's been a timely and anointed there's no real way to pray father for people to get it I mean, what am i going to ask you to do make them get it you don't circumvent people's will and you don't circumvent people's ideologies and their mindsets all i can really do is throw the seed on the ground some ground's going to be good some ground's going to be stony some's going to be thorny some didn't hear it when it came out of my mouth others haven't stopped hearing it since it came out So I can't work hearts. So, Father, I ask you to do that the way you do it. I don't even understand how you do it. If it were me, I'd smack them around and just make them take it. But you're not me. Thank God. So, Father, do what you do. And if anything, minister tenderly to a heart to drop the veil. Just be real. Only when we're real do we walk in liberty. In Jesus' name, amen.